I'm Liz Faubless, and this is Currents. The Democratic National Convention wraps up. What to make of the week's events? I think he really tried to defend the work that he'd done up to this point, um, addressing that, you know, it, 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 it's, it's, a, it's a slow move in the right direction. Plus, as we approach the anniversary, we'll go into the deep to talk about September 11th. A very sad moment in our history. Um, at the same time, we saw a lot of heroism happening at the, at the same time. There's the sadness, but also glory. And answering the call, six men take the next step toward the path to priesthood. When I was six or seven, I was in Mass, and I used to look up at the priest, and I was always very, I saw, I was amazed. You look around the church, and you see everybody who's all looking up at the priest, all praying very fervently. Good evening and thank you for joining us for Current's Week in Review. It was another week of politics taking center stage as the Democrats held their convention nominating President Obama to a run for a second term. One week after his own record was attacked, President Obama went on the offensive attacking the Republican plan, including Mitt Romney's proposal to give tax breaks to the wealthy. The president said that this year's presidential election is, quote, the clearest choice of any time in a generation. And just as he did at the Republican National Convention, Cardinal Timothy Dolan gave the final benediction at the Democratic National Convention. In his prayer, Cardinal Dolan asked God for his benediction on those waiting to be born that they may be welcomed and protected. That came just days after Democrats approved a platform that included allowing abortion on demand. The platform itself was also controversial for other reasons. It originally removed a reference to God, but restored it just a day later. For more on the week for the Democrats, I sat down with Brian Kasuba of the Catholic Citizens Committee, a group of lay Catholics that advocates the teachings of the church in the public public arena. Brian, thanks again for being here with us. The Democratic National Convention this week, amid all the keynote speakers, all the fiery speeches, Tuesday and Wednesday, two guests stand out with you. Explain why. Yeah, Liz, it, it was an interesting week for the Democrats. You know, Tuesday, they, they roll out with a lot of pro-choice speakers, a lot of women's rights issues right out of the gate. And you're thinking, okay, they're, they're really not, you know, shying away from their, their you know, pro-choice stance. And then you have Kathleen Sabalas, the uh, you know, Director of Health and Human Services speaks, who's a Catholic herself. You think, okay, they're going to address the HHS mandate right here, right now. And she doesn't say a word about it. So it's like, okay, they're not going to do this. They're not going to touch this. And then all of a sudden, on uh, Wednesday, out of nowhere, you have uh, you know, Sister Simone Campbell uh, from the Nuns on the Bus. And uh, she gives this really riveting speech, which basically changes the topic of, of the conversation mm -hmm. for the Catholic voters. And instead of really addressing the HHS mandate, she focuses on the Romney-Ryan budget bill and uh, talks specifically about how, the, how the, the U.S. Conference of Bishops themselves have come out against the, the, the Ryan bill, um, particularly saying that it doesn't do enough uh, and, and, and it cuts way too much to, to that protect vulnerable and poor people. And what do you think talks like that and speeches like that do with regard to Catholic sentiment? It's interesting. This is what's the, the hard issues with the Catholic vote and trying to define w where the vote's going to go and what makes it really a swing vote is because Catholics don't necessarily always subscribe to the same unfortunate principles. Um, there are a lot of liberal and moderate Catholics here, here in the States that don't necessarily believe in, in, in the, in the, in the pro-life, uh, you know, issues that the Republican Party and, 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 the, and the Catholic Church The preaches. diversity of the Catholic vote makes Absolutely. it really difficult to target. Definitely. So in, in this case, you know, in, instead of the, the Democrats, you know, really s addressing the HSS mandate, which basically really united all Catholics together, they were trying to speak to those liberal and moderate Catholics and saying, okay, but we're still doing these issues. We're still focusing on the issues of poverty, on immigration, on these issues. And when, some, when Sister Simone talks about the woman from Hershey who had cancer, who lost her job, lost her health insurance, mm -hmm. and ended up dying because of that. Sister Simone said, well, this is part of my pro-life stance. Okay. We need to protect these people. Brian, before we dissect the speeches from this past week, I, I want to ask you, if, if President Obama wins a second term, when leaders of the Catholic Church and the Obama administration pick up discussions, which I assume that they will, we know what the issues are. Where do we go from here? I think I, I think there are a lot of places we can go. Um, I, I think 
the Obama administration needs to do more um, to make sure that they're not infringing upon the First, First Amendment right to, right to religion. Mm -hmm. uh, re religious liberty needs to be protected. And they need to not only say that, but they need to do that with, with actions. Um, and, and, and that's key. They really need to have that discussion to make sure that whatever mandates HHS or whatever mandates you know, the, the Affordable Health Care Act provide do not infringe upon the Catholic Church. And I talk about uh, issues that not only affect the Catholic Church and Catholics, but the nation. Uh, today, the jobs report out this morning, unemployment rate inched a little bit lower. We created 96,000 jobs, but overall, it really was a disappointment. When you talk about issues like this to, to constituents and, and to the Catholic voters, what's an unemployed mom or dad or, or recent grad to do in this environment? And, and how does the committee that you lead help lead these people and inform them, especially as we head toward the vote? Yeah, it, you know, obviously our, our focus thus far has been in focusing on educating Catholic voters on, 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 the, on the Catholic issues that, that the candidates are, are uh, discussing. Um, but we, we, you know, we want to make sure that, you know, obviously the, the Catholic Church is not a one-issue church. Mm -hmm. um, there are many <laughs> issues that we talked about you know, Im immigration rights uh, being one of them, which the Democrats have done a little bit with, and they even had an undocumented immigrant speak the other night uh, for the first time in convention history. And I think that struck a chord to a lot of, you know, Catholic, you know, immigrants, especially here in New York City. Like I said, we have a great Catholic migration office. Um, and, and that speaks to that demographic to make mm -hmm. sure that they, you know, get rights, are able to get citizenship, are able to get, you know, jobs. and, 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 and really get on their way to, to, that, to, to lead a, a good American life. Very, very key issues. You're absolutely right, Brian. And before we let you go in the time that we have left, I have to address this this week. Changes to the Democratic platform. Absolutely. I'm sure you've heard about it. Removing the words God given. <coughs> there were about three sentences identifying Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. Now, of course, that decision has since been reversed. A momentary gaffe, in your opinion, or a portrayal of the democratic platform as it has conveyed its views with regard to religious liberty and its acceptance of mm -hmm. some of the religious concerns that we have. Yeah, I, I personally didn't think it was that big of a deal. When you look at the platform, even after, I think, I think the line that they took out was talking about, you know, being able to work with people to provide them with the necessary avenues to, you know, to work with their God-given talents and God-given rights. They took that line out, but if you look to see what else was in the platform, I believe faith was mentioned 11 times, um, I believe religion was mentioned nine times, church twice, and clergy tr once in, mm -hmm. in, in their platform before they put God back in. Um, and then you got to look at why they put it back in, and I think that came directly from the president himself saying we need to put this back in the platform. And not always does the president have you know, the platform ahead of them. He doesn't necessarily control the platform, the party does. Mm -hmm. And this goes back to what we were saying earlier in the week, that at the end of the day, it's not the party that's necessarily going to be making the decisions in the Oval Office, it's, it's, it's the president. So it's either going to be Romney or Obama. And the fact that he felt the need to say, look, we got to put this back in, we have to amend this, I think speaks to the, the president's, you know, belief that God and religious freedom and religious issues need to have a role. And I think that's because the Catholics have been such, you know, a vocal, local um, community right now on this issue going into the convention. Brian, in your opinion, did the president last night say anything new? Did we take away anything new from, from his speech, from his strategy? Were there any concrete ideas, especially with regard to issues that affect the Catholic Church? Did he make a case for four more years? I think a lot of what he did last night was really just be a little more presidential. It wasn't that sort of you know, rousing speech that we're used to from the last campaign. I think he really tried to defend the work that he'd done up to this point, um, addressing that, you know, it, 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 it's, it's, a, it's a slow move in the right direction, you know, pleading for the ability to have four more years to continue the work that he's done. Mm -hmm. um, I don't necessarily know if he really outlined anything new, new and specific, but he contrasts with what the Republicans were saying that they would do and in in, in trying to make the case that their plans were not any better than what we were, were already on the, on, the, on the right track to do in his opinion. All right, Brian, thank you so much. As always, a very comprehensive recap. We really appreciate having you here. Thanks, Liz. And there's more on the presidential election straight ahead when we return my interview with the head of one group that has graded President Obama and Mitt Romney. Welcome back to Currents Week in Review. I'm Liz Faublis. 
The Democratic National Convention may be over, but there's still a long way to go before the November elections. And as the candidates know, every vote counts. That's why President Obama and Mitt Romney and their respective running mates, Joe Biden and Paul Ryan, are traveling from state to state to drum up support as the election approaches. This week, we heard from a group that's looking to help keep people informed before they head into the voting booth. The Catholic Hispanic Leadership Alliance has released a voting guide that includes their ratings of President Obama and Mitt Romney. I spoke with the president of the Catholic Hispanic Leadership Alliance, Robert Aguirre. So Robert, you've created this document and you encourage voters to use the content as part of their decision making before entering the voting booth in November. What specifically is in this document should pollsters expect to read? What we have done here in this document is we've taken 23 issues that revolve around the priority issues of the United States bishops and and have looked at the the position of the two candidates and the history of the two presidential candidates of the major parties uh, and basically assess them against these 23 questions that that are deemed important uh, by our bishops. Mm -hmm. And uh, we did that in order to gain a better understanding uh, of how each candidate measures up against Catholic social and moral teaching. And Robert, before we break down how the candidates fared, I want to know which issues, first of all, stood out as the most concerning to those that you polled. Was it abortion? Was it religious freedom? Well, I can't say that any stood out more than the others. Mm -hmm. It's simply an assessment of 23, of 23 issues, uh, not done by poll, mm -hmm. uh, is simply taking, taking 23 issues and assessing each individual candidate on their history and their position. Okay. So, so really, one doesn't stand out any more than than the other. They either are in line with Catholic moral and social teaching, or they're not. Okay, and let's break it down now. How do the candidates fare, beginning with President Obama? Uh, not too well. Uh, President Obama uh, came in with uh, matching only 17 percent of the 23 issues in terms of church position. Uh, as compared to uh, Governor Romney, who came, came in at matching at 52 percent uh, of the issues, also a fairly low score in terms of in terms of the church's position, but comparatively much different between the two candidates. And the guide is intended actually to be a moral compass, so to speak, and a way to kind of keep pace with our consciousness with regard to faith and our basic rights. The candidates, as you mentioned, didn't fare as well as you expected, or, or were any of the were any of the uh, results a surprise to you? No, I can't say that they were really a, a surprise. Uh, the, you know, these kinds of issues don't exactly sneak up on you and, <laughs> and surprise you. They they happen a little bit each day, each week, each month. So there were no great surprises uh, on here. I think that that using, as you say, the moral compass provided by by Catholic teaching um, is is a comparison that has to be made, but but in the end it's still going to to rely on on the hearts of people of goodwill, as as the bishops state in their in their document, faithful citizenship. Mm -hmm. uh, it's still going to rely on on the consciences and, and the hearts of people of goodwill to make the final decision uh, in the voting booth. Robert, there is such a call for Catholics to come into the voting booths. This year, it seems more than any other year in, in my recent memory. How important is the Catholic vote right now? Well, I think the Catholic vote is, is always important. I think it is particularly important this time. Uh, we're, we're at an unprecedented point in, in our country's history, and, and um, you know, the Wall Street Journal you know, even referred to it as you know, as as a as a war that that was declared by President Obama, and it was a war that that certainly Catholics did not want, uh, but it's one that we find ourselves in the midst of, and so uh, we are obliged and obligated by our faith to to respond to that, and it heightens our sense of responsibility in terms of our roles as being faithful citizens. 
Robert, in the time that we have left, something really struck me while reading your guide, and, and I want to get your opinion on this in, in our last question. You say that Catholics have a responsibility to, bo to vote with an informed conscience formed by the gospel rather than from habit or tradition. Can you please explain that? Well, I think a lot of us, I mean, all people are people of habits. We're people of traditions. Uh, we cling to the things that make us comfortable, the things that we have always done. Uh, you know, this is a time when, when we really have to take stock in that and come to terms with what our real responsibilities are as Catholics uh, and as citizens. And for those who, who are used to voting a certain way uh, because, of a, because of a label or a party, uh, this is not the time to do that. It's a time for deep reflection. It's a time for real consideration uh, and coming to terms with your conscience and coming to terms with your faith. That's going to force a lot of people to do something different that they don't traditionally do. And Robert, really quickly, where can voters get a copy of your guide? On the website at, at www.catholichispanic.org, all one word, catholichispanic.org. All right. Thank you so much for that. I really appreciate your being here with us and uh, hope to speak to you again very soon. Thank, Thank you, you so for much, having Robert. me. You're very welcome. And please be sure to keep it with Currents for news you can use as we head toward the November elections. Now, don't go anywhere. There's more Currents Week in Review straight ahead. Coming up, remembering September 11th, 2001, we go into the deep with Bishop DiMarzio. I happened to be in Washington, D.C. at a bishop's meeting, and uh, we had the same issue there with the, the Pentagon uh, being uh, attacked and uh, the fighter jets all over the, the city at that time. Welcome back. Eleven years ago, terrorists attacked the United States on September 11, 2001. Nineteen militants associated with the Islamic extremist group Al-Qaeda hijacked four airliners and carried out suicide attacks against targets in the United States. Two of the planes were flown into the towers of the World Trade Center in New York City. A third plane hit the Pentagon just outside Washington, D.C. Passengers on board a fourth hijacked airliner attempted to regain control of the aircraft. That plane crashed in a Pennsylvania field rather than its intended target, the U.S. Capitol building in Washington. Overall, those attacks claimed nearly 3,000 lives, the vast majority at the World Trade Center here in New York. It was one of the deadliest attacks on U.S. territory. Many of us may even remember where we were and what we were doing on that fateful morning. Well, over a decade later, we have not forgotten the events of September 11th. However, there have also been countless lessons to learn, including the importance of the power of prayer. I talked more about this with Bishop DiMarzio. Remembering September 11th is the topic of this week's Into the Deep. Bishop DiMarzio, thank you for joining us. Always love Always having you in the studio. <laughs> Very somber topic. September 11th. It's been 11 years. I, I stop and think about it. It's been over a decade. When you think back about that, what, what first comes to mind? What are your thoughts? Well, it's a, it's a very sad moment in our history. Um, at the same time, we saw a lot of heroism happening at the, at the same time. as the sadness, but also glory uh, that came out of that day. Uh, that uh, will go down in history and never be to be forgotten. So it's, it's mix, obviously mixed emotions. There are days, especially in September, and I walk outside and I look up and the days are beautiful and they're glorious, and I find myself stopping and right. thinking, it was a day like this. That's right. Do you remember anything in particular about that day? Well, it was a glorious day. I happened to be in Washington, D.C. at a bishop's meeting, and uh, we had the same issue there with the, the Pentagon. Uh, being uh, attacked and uh, the fighter jets all over the, the city at that time. Uh, and I was Bishop of Camden at that time. So, um, yeah, it, there's a lot of memories, uh, you know, the whole uh, the, the uncertainty. Perhaps the, the country was shocked that something like this could happen. We felt so safe. It really uh, broke our... Uh, our um, theory that, you know, somehow we're invincible, uh, but brought us down to reality. What will be taking place in and around the diocese to s commemorate the anniversary? Well, again, there's so many parish celebrations. Almost every parish would have some commemoration. Uh, there are other uh, 
events that happen uh, at the site. Um, certainly uh, the, the fire department, the police department, all of them, with the chaplains that we have there, they're participating. There's certain annual events that happen, so it's, it's, uh, it's not forgotten. Not forgotten, I'm, I'm very happy you said that. Bishop DeMarcio, it was an extremely tragic day. Yeah. That's not lost on anyone. And prayer and spiritual healing mm -hmm. is definitely part of the process of getting past this. But what more can people that are still grieving do? Yeah, well, grieving is a, is a time-limited uh, thing. You, you don't grieve for the rest of your life on something, but you can never forget. So there's a difference between grieving and mourning and not forgetting. So there's a growth process that we have to come to accept reality. We have to have the spiritual insight to recognize that we, we know that life is not ended with death, that life continues. It's eternal life we believe in. So we have to take courage at times like this, especially recognizing the, all the truths of our faith. Are there any special prayers you would recommend for anyone to go through this process of healing and spirituality? I think the Our Father is, you know, the prayer we all know. If you take that petition by petition, there's eight petitions there, and you have forgiveness, you have doing God's will. It's all there. It's the perfect prayer. It's the prayer Jesus taught us. Uh, if that's meditated upon and spoken out slowly and prayed, I think that could be a great consolation. I've always been a devout Catholic, and I'm very proud of that. But there are certain parts of certain events in my life that kind of just re-energize that spirituality in me. Did you find after the events of September 11th that more people came to the church, more people were seeking healing, were seeking God? Oh, no, there's no question about it. I mean, uh, it didn't last forever, but people did return. They were looking for some spiritual values, some, some uplifting um, parts that their religion could give them. So it, it happened, and people forget over time. What do you think we can do uh, just as a community, as a church community, to encourage people not just to visit church only yeah. when, you know, in times of need and in times yeah. of tragedy, but, you know, and to avoid those tragic moments in our lives? Yeah, I guess 9-11 uh, is a good example of how this can be sustained because people still, when you talk about 9-11, whatever spirituality they have, little great is, is called upon. So it is a good day to, that brings us back to our senses, brings us back to God. Um, there's always some good that comes out of evil, and I think a lot of good came out of that day as much as there was evil. So it is a, a day to remember and go back and think about. I'd like to leave it on that encouraging okay. note. Thank you so much, Bishop DeMarcio. Okay. I appreciate it. You're welcome. And stay tuned, there's more Currents Ahead. When we return, these seminarians move a step closer to the priesthood. We're here to ordain the transitional deacons who will be ordained, please God, in June as priests. Finally tonight, each June, the Diocese of Brooklyn welcomes new priests as Bishop DiMarzio ordains these men to serve the church in Brooklyn and Queens. And although those ordinations are still months away, last weekend, six seminarians set to be ordained next year took the next step on the path to the priesthood at a special mass at St. James Cathedral. In your eternal providence, Today we're here to ordain the transitional deacons who will be ordained, please God, in June as priests. Well, today we have a really a variety of, of people from different parts of the diocese that represent different groups. I got my calling to the priest um, when I was young, actually. Um, when um, my father died when I was at a young age, when I was eight. And then a year later after he passed away, I became an altar server at my home parish. And then people kept saying to me, maybe you should think about priesthood. And I prayed one night in, uh, gra in eighth grade. I said, God, if you really want me to become a priest, show me some kind of sign. And little did I know, he answers prayer very quickly that the next day at Cathedral, uh, members from Cathedral Prep Seminary in Elmhurst uh, for our Catholic high school week, they came to visit my school and talk about the seminary. So ever since then, I felt like God was calling me. God you know, planted a seed in me ever since, you know, in the beginning that he wanted me to be a priest. 
when I was six or seven, I was in Mass, and I used to look up at the priest, and I was always very, I saw, I was amazed. You look around the church, and you see everybody who's all looking up at the priest, all praying very fervently. And as I've grown up, and as I've come to understand my faith more and more, I felt deeper and deeper the calling that this is what I want to do with my life as well, that I want to represent the same truth that all of these people are praying to and have given their lives for. There were a lot of emotions today during the Mass. When we laid down on the marble floor and prostrated ourselves during the Litany of the Saints, you can hear everyone praying for you, and you can't see anything. All you can see is the marble. But there's a solitude. You know it's you and God. And when you stand up after that, knowing that you have everyone's support, knowing you have everyone's prayers, you get up, I felt much more confident. I, I felt a great sense of proudness of my son accomplishing this next step as deacon. I was quite overwhelmed by seeing a lot of the uh, priests we knew. We know what uh, a great job they currently do in their parishes and in the community. So thinking that my son will uh, look toward the potential of accomplishing that same thing, I, it's an awesome thing. Her wishes for me in the future, her hopes for me in the future is to be the to be the best priest, to be the priest for the people, not for myself, be the priest for the people, and to show the people the love that Christ showed his disciples and his people at that time. He wants, she hopes that I do the same thing with my people at my parish. And that is all for this edition of Current's Week in Review. Be sure to join us again on Monday night. We'll look ahead to Pope Benedict's trip to Lebanon. Until then, be sure to visit us online at CurrentsNY.net. For all of us here at Currents, I'm Liz Faubless. We leave you tonight with scenes from last weekend's Deacon's Ordination at St. James Cathedral. Thank you for watching and have a good night.